Well, Taylor, thank you so much for joining us for these, this face-to-face -face podcast and our Olympic special series. First of all, many congratulations coming back from Paris with a silver medal from the uh, relay. Firstly, how has it been? Like, how, how has the reaction been? How have you felt since coming back? What's it been like? I mean, winning an Olympic medal is, you know, every athlete's dream and, you know, to win silver with the team, with the U.S. team um, in such a close race was was really special, and um, the outpouring of support and congratulations, not just from you know people who watch the sport, but like people I grew up with and um, friends and family, and you know everyone who's been involved in this process was was really special, and I feel like it meant just as much to me as it did to them and and I think it was rewarding for all of us. Well that's that's really nice to hear but it, it was absolutely wild as well we, we came off of the US leg of, of the trip you went to the WNBA game and you were presented to 20,000 people who we went absolutely wild for for you they were getting stopped in the street for selfies I mean is this is this like something you've ever experienced before? Um, no I wasn't expecting that um, but the Olympics has such a an impact in the US and I think going to that WNBA game was really cool because all these these the audience basically they were there to support women's sports and to see another athlete who also achieved success in another sport I think was really cool for them and it was special to be recognized in the US because that doesn't happen very often for me um, in Europe, it's a little different because of the, the culture behind triathlon, but yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing moment, I guess, especially in the US is like such a, obviously such a vast country and for short course racing, it's always kind of struggled with that, that cut through to some degree and, and particularly in recent years where I guess Ironman brand is kind of dominated and if there are athletes, I guess that are to be recognized, it's generally them, right? Yeah, yeah. In the U.S., you generally have, you know, American football, um, baseball, basketball, and mostly men's sports. Um, I think women's sports that kind of thrive might be a bit of tennis or golf, but um, in triathlon, it's like, it's just a very niche sport, especially short course. And to, to have this sort of recognition for the sport of triathlon in the US and at you know a WNBA game on like in front of you know thousands of people in the crowd like you were there you saw how excited everyone got that was really really special and a, a moment I'll always remember yeah it was absolutely bonkers <laughs> I can say that for anybody who's watching it was insane like the noise level when you were presented to the crowd just went off the off the charts it was it was a really great moment um, so let's just go back to Paris quickly. Obviously the mixed relay is, is where you got your medal, but let's just touch into, onto how you were feeling going into that, having raced the individual, you finished 10th in the individual. How, how did you feel about how that race went and how it played out for you in the individual? Um, so the individual, I would say, was just personally for me, a disappointment. I mean, a top 10 is always good, but um, I just was not feeling myself that day and the week before I think because it was my first Olympics I didn't necessarily understand the demands of you know everything that it entailed it wasn't like any other race I had been to where we're in a hotel we're in the Olympic Village and we have all these other obligations and and it was a really cool experience but it was definitely taxing and it, it I think it played a, a big factor you know, not for the better for the individual race, unfortunately. Um, so I was pretty disappointed. Um, but after that race, I, myself and, you know, some of the other American athletes, we took a step back and we just went off back actually to a hotel and we just did our own thing for a few days and um, we came back you know, with a little bit more energy just because we had felt a bit more rested going into the relay and we wanted to give this relay everything we could, not just for ourselves, but for each other because it was more of a, it's more of a team, team event versus the individual. And 
you know, we didn't want to let each other down. And so, yeah, I think, I think I'm, I mean, I'm really happy that we were able to, you know, recognize what we needed and go into the relay with, you know, a bit more freshness. Um, but yeah, I was looking back, I'll, I'll take some notes, you know, maybe if I make it to LA 2028. Um, but knowing that I was the only female athlete in the top 10 that stayed in the village, um, that kind of, you know, shows kind of why top level athletes in a high energy demanding sport like triathlon, um, like a two hour race, aren't staying there. So um, nothing against the village. It just, yeah, it took a lot of energy out of me. Well, it's really interesting actually, because there's been quite a bit of talk about this uh, afterwards, not, not just in triathlon, but I noted the other day that I think Rafa Nadal said something about, well, if you're going to the Olympics, you've got to stay in the village. Like to a lot of the tennis players, obviously incredibly wealthy, stay with their teams uh, all, all over the place. Yeah. And then there's other people who go, well, actually, you know what, this is the pinnacle of my career and I, I want to be do what I've got to do to perform. So do you think it's a case of you felt like you needed to soak in the atmosphere or you were just, I guess, a little bit uh, unaware or naive to the to the demands of, of what would crop up of being being in the village with so many other athletes and so forth? I think, yeah, I was a little naive and I think we were a little bit overscheduled in terms of all the other obligations we have, not necessarily being in the village, but things that required, you know, interviews and time on our feet that are taxing when it comes down to, you know, preparing for a race that's two hours long. Mm. Um, I think for other sports, it's probably not as you know it doesn't have as much of a negative effect on like how tired they are going into the race but for longer sports i think you know there's a reason why uh you know the top top athletes didn't stay there unfortunately and um yeah i'm just taking notes <laughs> yeah this is it's interesting and i guess I guess there's reflections for you, probably for USA Triathlon as well in, in all of this, I'm sure, because all the federations are going to learn kind of what helps their athletes perform. But I'm wondering, is it, is it also a difference? Because you're, you know, you're, I, I don't know the politest way to put this, but you're a more senior athlete than a, than a junior athlete, you know, perhaps for those that are coming in who are getting a chance to go to the Olympics for the first time and they're, you know, 20 or early 20s or something like that, then experiencing that culture is perhaps, and having that whole experience of the Olympics is more important. As Whereas perhaps if you're a more senior athlete, then actually you're there for performance and that's what you're there for. Not really the experience as such, but the performance. Yeah, I mean, I understand that like, not all federations have the financial means to stay outside of the village, etc. And obviously like, we're all there to do our best but there's a few of us that are, you know, really hoping to earn a medal at the Olympics. And I think doing everything possible uh, to make sure you're prepared and rested and fresh is, is really important. But yeah, I think some athletes were only there for two days before, which is totally different than us. And we were there for almost a week before. So, so that also says something like two days is fine, but, but a week before, you know, the most important race of, you know, your career, I, I would do something different if I could go back. But at the end of the day, I'm really glad that, you know, we were able to take a step back and still perform in the relay because that was really special with, you know, my other teammates and, you know, to represent the USA is, is really cool and, and to earn a medal for them was very memorable. Well, it also shows a lot of uh, maturity and self-awareness on, on the behalf of you and your teammates that you kind of recognise that that was the place you needed to put yourself in. I'm intrigued though, like when you have these days, I'm sure you're all still training and stuff, but you're in the, ho you're in the hotel, you've gone somewhere else. What are you doing? Are you getting a bit of your own time? Are you hanging around together playing board games? Are you watching Netflix together or just doing your own thing? Um, well, triathletes obviously were we're, we do an individual sport, so we're very introverted. We like our alone time, and that's what we're used to going into a race, whereas the village is kind of more of an extroverted environment. You're, 
seeing people when you walk to the dining hall and you're chatting and, and this and that and everything takes a bit longer because you're seeing all these people that you really want to see but it takes so much longer mm. and, and as an introverted you know athlete um, you don't want that before a race so I think like staying in a hotel I think just like you know reading a book or watching Netflix and just ordering Uber Eats and and just chilling in your room is is really nice because you put in this big block of work and you just want to soak it all in and, and rest up so you have enough energy on you know performance day so my visions of you all like being team usa together sitting around playing monopoly or something a, a kind of a bit off beam right you're just actually it's the opposite is to get your own space entirely um a little bit, but we did we did watch Miracle together as like an inspirational moment for the team. Um, one of our teammates, Morgan, he suggested it like a few months ago. And so we did watch that as a team. And so I knew this was really important to him. And he just wanted to bring the team together because I think sometimes it's a bit easier to fight for someone else than it is for yourself in terms of a race. And so I made note to take like a quote from the movie. So I would say it before we, we started. And um, do you remember the quote? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't like quote it verbatim, but I got the gist of it. And it was like something like nine times out of 10, they're going to beat us. But this is that one time. And so he really liked that and everyone mm -hmm. loved it. And so um, yeah, and then after the race, I was like, see, this is that one time out of 10. And it really, and it really was. So from your mindset then, it's, it's really fascinating. You kind of, how, how did you go, what process did you go through in those days then to move beyond, I'm feeling disappointed for myself to actually, there's still a huge opportunity here for me and the team. Um, I think I've been in situations before because I've competed in the relay, you know, probably more than almost anyone else who had competed at the Olympics in the relay. And so I knew that, like, not performing in the individual doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a bad performance the next day. And sometimes you even feel better. Um, so I think it sharpened us all up a bit and the conditions were better, it wasn't raining. Um, luckily, the race wasn't postponed, and I think we were all there just to, to hype each other up and, and just all that energy. And after, you know, have it, all of us had like pretty disappointing individual races, and I think we just wanted the best, not just for ourselves, but for each other. And, we pulled it off. <laughs> well, can you talk us a little bit through your, your leg of it? You were off second, the, f the first female, but the second in the, in the race. How, how, how was it from when you got the handover to when you handed over? Yeah, I, I knew I had to kind of keep us at the front of the race to the best of my abilities. Um, I had a strange swim, didn't really do what I needed to do there, but I made up for it on the bike and um, I could tell I was feeling good because I could tell everyone around me was suffering a bit more than normal and I just did what I could the rest of the race and on the run to get myself as close to the front as possible and I knew when I handed off to the third person, which was Morgan, um, that we we're probably going to podium, and when I handed up to, off to Nib, the other tailor, um, I just hyped her up so much before. She was getting pretty annoyed, but um, I had a feeling she could maybe win it, and um, I was just like an annoying older sister or parent, and just like getting her pumped up, and it was really fun and exciting, and she did so good, and I think it goes to show that you know, when you put our A team together and like we're, we're pretty good and then a lot of people are counting us out. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating that you, you said you, you were confident of a, of a podium when you handed off. You're like, there's halfway through the race. There was still a lot of work to be done given the 
positions of, of the relative nations. I know France are obviously one of the favourites had obviously crashed by that point and, and that kind of took them out of the running. But that's really interesting that you were kind of already had a, a confidence in, in where this was going to go. Was that a confidence in what your teammates were going to execute, a confidence in the fact the other teams weren't going to be good enough to, to podium? I think it was more confidence in my teammates. I knew both Morgan and Nib. Not, not only did they have something to prove, but I knew how strong they were as athletes. Like, they're both incredible athletes. They've both won series races before. And I think when they're almost better when they have to prove something and like when they're chasing someone down. So I just had full faith in them. Once I handed off, I was like, okay, I think I did my job and I have full faith that they'll do theirs. So, I mean, that, that last leg from Taylor was uh, so exciting, wasn't it? I mean, the, the way she obviously approached the bike was no great surprise to anybody that she would crush it in the way she did, but it was still enthralling yeah. to watch. What's, what's kind of going through your mind, especially, I guess, as, as she's you know, making up ground and then she's kind of out the front and then you've got this three-way, incredible three-way battle that's going on. What, what are you thinking there? What are you thinking? this is going to be gold or, oh my goodness, is she going to be able to hang on? Or, or is it just a fluctuation from moment to moment? I mean, it was just exciting because I knew we were going to medal at that point, um, for, for sure. But I was a little stressed for Nib because her, most of her Olympic races, it has been raining. Mm. And she's been really timid because she's had so much bad luck, like in the TT, her brakes went out and she could just kept crashing. Mm. And it wasn't no fault of hers, it was just like, after that you get a little um, like bit of PTSD on the bike where you just have that feeling. So I knew she had the power, but I wasn't sure if she would have the technical skills to drop, you know, Lindemann, who I knew, mm. you know, could run for gold. And she did her best. And she tried to get rid of her, and Lindemann said she was hanging on for dear life. But um, I knew that if she got through that bike, she could, um, you know, t at least tire the other girls out quite a bit. And I know she she definitely had something to prove there, and she did so good because she said herself like she's a diesel engine, not a sprinter. Um, but at the like after all, she did run in university so <laughs> yeah. I don't know what she's talking about because <laughs> she did great I mean if you look at the other two girls she was running against like that was an incredible finish for her and and yeah I was just really proud of the way she raced and I'm glad I could play her annoying mom just before <laughs> he time her out <laughs> was she grateful for that afterwards uh, it doesn't sound like she was that grateful at the time but in reflection I think she deep down she I think it helped her but um, but she was just giving me a hard time. It must be so strange as well because your your kind of hopes and dreams suddenly rest on somebody else. And and all right, you're you're ran by the course, obviously, but you're kind of consuming the race the same as everybody else. You're relegated to spectator when you finish. And it's one thing if you're doing a four by one hundred because it's over so quickly, or even a four by four hundred. But this you've got to kind of wait all this time like watching these other people knowing kind of you, you're to some extent your fate is in their hands now and, the, and there's not much you can do it must be a weird feeling yeah I guess if you think about it it, it is like the longest relay yeah. <laughs> we have um, in sport that I can think of but yeah like like I said I had full faith in Morgan and Taylor and yeah I knew we we could have won I mean it was just yeah. by a fraction of a second but to come home with silver was also like yeah I had full faith in them I trust them completely and what were those moments like afterwards obviously you you get you're together as a team you're celebrating etc but then I guess even though it's a team event you're four individuals within the team so then you're going off to your own you know if you've got family or friends whether they're there or they're virtual or whatever it is what what were those kind of moments like what can you remember about that um, I mean, a lot of our family was there watching the race together, and I think that was that was cool for them because 
they had each other to watch mm -hmm. with because we were all racing as a team. Um, but yeah, I think we, we did a lot of like media and, and some cool things as a team after to celebrate the medal, but we went home pretty quickly after closing ceremonies and um, yeah, now here we are. Like I've been at Super League this whole time, or sorry, I've been at Super Try this oh, whole yeah, time. Yeah. Good work, well <laughs> and uh, Seth's been here too, and Morgan and Nib went back home, but I think we're all, we're just kind of like trying to soak it all in, but at the same time, um, I think we're all a bit tired just from the buildup and it's been a bit hard, I think, to totally celebrate the moment. Um, but yeah, I'd like to do something special like at some point with all of them. Yeah, it's interesting. It's been a been kind of a common theme speaking to a lot of people who went to the Olympics of this kind of period afterwards where computing it all is, is quite difficult, kind of you have this incredible moment in your career, in your life, and then suddenly life goes back to normal. And, but you kind of have to still go through a process of realizing what's happened to you, um, <clears throat> coming to terms with it, whether it's disappointment or it's glory, depending on how your ev uh, event went, and then kind of resetting and refocusing yourself. But it's not something that, that can happen overnight. It's a, it's a kind of interesting process. I'm really interested in that mindset and kind of how you look at that? Yeah, I think I'm actually glad I had Super Try just because it just gave me something kind of to do and another way to, you know, celebrate this medal through, you know, going to the WNBA game or doing some kids events um, to kind of share that with, you know, people that follow the sport or support me or or triathlon in general and just kind of like to keep that momentum going because I think if it was like a hard stop it would be like kind of a shock because you go from being so busy at the games like it's way more busy like I said than a normal race um, to just probably like the quiet of your home own home I think that would have been a bit tougher but then again, you're also so tired from all that training and all that travel and, you know, all that preparation. It's like, okay, what now? <laughs> like, I just want to, I just want to rest, but I just also don't want to like stop completely, I guess. And I guess you also need to figure out what is next in terms of, you know, your goals, because for, you know, most of the world, the pinnacle of, of most sports is achieving an Olympic medal and gold at the Olympics. So then it's like, okay, well, what's next? Whether you achieve that or not, it's kind of like, you have to figure that out for yourself, I guess. Yeah, and it, and it takes time as well, right? But I'm really interested as well in your, your um, mindset and, and, and how, it's, how it's developed because it's not been the easiest few years for you. And you know, you missed out on starting off really with missing out on Tokyo when you would have hoped to have had that first Olympic experience. Um, how, how, kind of how do you reflect on, on this kind of journey that you've gone on, especially over the last few years since, since, you know, since finding out that you weren't going to go to Tokyo? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think Tokyo, I was... I was obviously really disappointed that I didn't go. Um, the reasons I didn't go were very circumstantial based on, you know, qualification races and some things happening out of outside of my control. But at that time, I thought I was, you know, actually far fitter than I was going into Paris and far more of a medal potential than I was going into Paris as well, just in terms of like my health leading into the race. Um, in my preparation, but yeah, just the way things played out when you have a one-off race or or COVID that totally changes the dynamics of how teams are selected and and you know if your luggage doesn't arrive to your qualification race, how you deal with that. Like there were a lot of things that people don't know that I had to deal with on those qualification days that 
you know, were kind of the reason potentially why I was like one person away from qualifying. So um, I think looking back at that, that's just kind of frustrating to me that I never had that opportunity because I think I would have done really well and um, I would have had, you know, one more Olympics under my belt to prepare me for Paris. But um, yeah, it's really special that I did not only qualify for Paris, but I also won a medal. So. Yeah, and uh, um, well, you mentioned right at the start, and I wanted to bring it back before we, before we finished around the people that have supported you and, and kind of helped you through that, because obviously that was a really difficult time in your career and it, you, you're a sports person like anybody, you, you don't know. Like you've got, Paris has happened, it's been successful and you can look back now and go, okay, well maybe this was the great tapestry of life, the way this worked out. Um, but uh, you obviously don't know that at the time. Yeah. You don't know you were only, any athletes only ever one injury away from it being all over and you, you never would have got to go. So, like, who were you leaning on and, and how, how critical were these people to kind of helping you through and what, what have they done to help you? Um, yeah, I think in these moments I've had, you know, a few good friends who, like, either used to be my training partners or just people who know me and who I could, you know, call on the phone every day and talk to just because I wanted to talk to someone. So um, that was really, I think, helpful in those like tougher moments. But um, I think like, yeah, without the support system I had, whether it be like these friends or, you know, my, my training group, even they're not just my training group or a bunch of you know, females who have basically, we're basically a family. I mean, we've trained together, the majority of us, for the last, like, six years, seven years. So um, having them as well has been, you know, so helpful. And um, we all go through these ups and downs in sport and in life. And I think it's, it's important that you have these people because without them, you're just kind of alone. And... Uh, it's not easy like to go through these tough times alone so I'm very grateful and I hope that them seeing me you know get to Paris and earn the medal was equally as rewarding for them. Well I'm, I'm sure it was but I've got to ask you because you, I, I've, I've tried to stray away from asking people in, in the Olympic stuff for, for the reasons we discussed earlier kind of what next mm -hmm. because I, I kind of almost think it's a bit of a loaded and unfair question however you teased earlier <laughs> LA 28, <clears throat> so I can't leave without asking if that's like something that's, that's you, as you've mentioned it, you think is seriously on the agenda. Um, honestly, I have no idea. I'm older, on the older side of the athletes, but I'm also like younger in terms of the sport. Um, I didn't do this sport when I was a kid, um, but also like my body, I can only ask so much of my body. I think if it wasn't in LA, which is mm. where I'm from, um, I would probably be telling you no, but who knows? Right now I'm gonna take on a few other challenges just to like, you know, keep the spark alive in terms of like, you know, training can get a bit monotonous. So I'm trying some oh, longer, you in your TT <laughs> some longer <laughs> course stuff just you know, to see how that goes, but um, let's just say we'll see. <laughs> Ask me in 2026. <laughs> okay, right, we'll book in another interview in 2026 <laughs> and we'll pick up on it then, but that's kind of completely fair enough. Look, Taylor, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, speak to us about this, and again, many, many congratulations on your success. Yeah, thank you.